Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our live stream today. Um, my name is Katisha Anderson. Um, I am a senior program manager with Microsoft. Um, I would like to welcome you to our very first Juneteenth um, celebration. Um, within the day, you will have the opportunity to do to join two different tracks, multiple speakers, and hear very inspiring messages um, regarding the Black experience in tech. Um, to start, we will take eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence, um, and then we'll come back and introduce our, our leader um, keynote and follow up from there. So for the ne next eight minutes and 46 seconds, uh, we will maintain silence. Thank you.
Thank you again, everyone, uh, for joining. Um, again, we appreciate you showing up today. Um, I would now like to introduce you to our founder of this awesome Juneteenth celebration, Michael Brown. Michael. Thank you, Kotisha, and thank you, everyone, for uh, all of your support, all of your words of encouragement, and for joining us in this celebration of Juneteenth. Um, it's been a, an amazing adventure bringing this together. And I hope that we all step from this conference encouraged, enlightened, and uplifted. Uh, as we all know, Juneteenth, well, maybe some don't know, but of course, according to some, no one knows about it. But <laughs> Juneteenth is a celebration of the day the free the former slaves in Galveston were told they were free two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. It was the start of a long journey to where we are now, still fighting to receive acceptance of America as more than second class citizens. We are encouraged by the support around the world for the Black Lives Matter movement. We are encouraged by the actual action taking place where mayors and governors and senators around the country are saying that it's time to fix what's wrong. We are excited for what lies ahead, but we know there's more to, more to more to progress for our country and for ourselves. We are divided. It's not a partisanship. It's not Republican versus Democrat. This is civil rights. This is recognizing our humanity. And that's why we are fighting. But today is a time to celebrate where we are and how far we've come, knowing and looking forward to what lies ahead. We have a, an amazing lineup. So many talented speakers came forward to provide their insights, their encouragement, and their knowledge. And I am humbled and so thankful that so many people spoke up and showed out for us. Um, sorry, I froze there. We are looking forward to the rest of this conference and looking forward to the conversations that come out of it. First, I must thank, as I always have, the talented team of people who put in so much effort and energy to make sure the, this weekend was possible. And I want to thank all of you for coming so that we weren't speaking to an empty space. Enjoy the conference and I look forward to talking to everyone in the days ahead. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and as you mentioned, we do have amazing speakers and amazing lineup today. Uh, I am excited about what this holds as a very first event. Um, I, I think we will have um, a lot of questions and dialogue, which is healthy. Um, so with that said, I would like to introduce you to our very first speaker. Um, he organizes meet meetups, he speaks in prison, and he's using tech to transform cities. Uh, our speaker has spent 10 years working in, spent 10 years working in gas stations, liquor stores, and small retail. retail. However, he knew that the path to tech was possible, he just didn't know how until a rapper changed his life. Introducing our speaker, Danny Thompson. Danny, take it away. Thank you very much. I'm beyond excited to be here tonight and today with all of you. Uh, one of the big reasons why I even wanted to do this conference was we have people, and you can see in the chat, we have people from all over the world that are now paying attention to Juneteenth. 
you know, I grew up uh, from very humble beginnings. I grew up, quote unquote, in the hood. And it was talked about there. And as I left, I realized this is not so spoken about in all communities. And I want to help in any way that I can make sure people all over the world recognize how important this day is. So one thing that I also want to stress is I'm, I don't dress up often. So I dress up for a job interview. I dress up for, you know, special occasions and I dressed up today. Uh, well, I have dressed up as long as I don't stand up, I'm still dressed up, you know? Uh, but I wanted to make sure that I show you the respect that I have for you even being here with us today. The reason why I got into tech was because of a rapper. This rapper was uh, investing $10 million into a tech company, and he was being interviewed for that. And this kind of caught my attention. I was 30 years old at the time, and I realized I need to make a change in life. And of course, you know, he was asked, why are you investing so much money into a tech company? And he said I was learning how to code. Now, this amazed me because I didn't know coding was for the average individual. At that time in my life, I genuinely believed coding was strictly for the PhD holders and the rocket scientists of the world. It wasn't for an average person like me. You know, the geniuses belong in that category. And so obviously he's not learning how to code to, you know, get a job in tech. He's learning how to code because he wants to learn how to code. And his reasoning was profound. You know, he said, why wouldn't I want to know how to code? Why wouldn't I want to have the basic understandings of the devices that I'm touching out of 90% out of my day? Like we have a basic understanding of our body, right? If I get sick, I understand either A, I need to go to see a doctor, something is not right, or B, I can ride this out. Like this is something I can handle. Or if my car makes a very weird sound, I know I need to take this to a mechanic. So why don't I have the same basic understandings out of this amazing machine that I'm touching all day long? Like why is my understanding limited to YouTube.com and Internet Explorer and Chrome? Why, why don't I understand more? So uh, he starts learning how to code, and so do I. And I get on freecodecamp.org, and that's exactly where I started. And on that day, and the only reason why I remember the day I started coding was I made a uh, index card, and I wrote my goal down on an index card, and I put it on my wall next to my computer because that was my commitment to myself that I will not stop learning after today. And I started in April of 2017, and I started learning how to code, and I just kept going, kept going. And I learned HTML and CSS and all that good stuff. And I start realizing that there's uh, something called meetups. Meetups are a thing where you can go there and you can meet people from the industry at all levels. And I saw this online. I said, you know, I need a, I need to go to one. And funny enough, I uh, went to this meetup. And the only reason why I found out about a meetup in my city in Memphis was a friend of mine. His name is Lawrence Lockhart. And he made a post on Facebook talking about how he changed his life and uh, he was going to this meetup. So I go to this meetup and at this time I am, uh, basically I know HTML, CSS, I made a very simple application where if you put the URL of an image, it returns it uh, with some coloring on top. It's basically at this point in my life, I can cure cancer with color, right? I got a crappy filter that I made, but I can cure cancer now. So I walk in this meetup and I realize very quickly, oh, I don't know anything. I have these people in there talking about Java, C Sharp, and it's a foreign language to me at this point. But now I'm hooked. I'm in there. My interest, I just realized there's a whole breadth of knowledge that I didn't even know existed. So now I'm very interested in this. And I realized very quickly that I am excluded from this conversation. I am not included. And at that moment, I said, I will never be excluded from this conversation again. So I go home and I start pounding these books and I'm studying and I'm studying and I start learning JavaScript and I start learning ES6 functions. And I go to the next meetup. I said, well, do you know ES6 functions? Do you know an arrow function? And then I start studying some more and more and more. And then I say, oh, do you know how to look up a, C a SQL query? Do you know how to look up a SQL table? Then I start learning more and more and more. And I said, well, do you know how you can do this in Java? Now I've been brought in this community of these amazing developers. And the most amazing thing about a meetup are these people want to share in your success. They understand your milestones and achievements. When I try to tell my wife or anyone in my family about something that I've created, they just kind of look at it, uh-huh, okay, yeah. 
They don't understand the amount of work and the challenges that are involved with trying to make these things happen. But a meetup, everyone knows what you're going through. Everyone knows how long it must have taken for you just to get this one button to work. Meetups can absolutely and always change your life. If it wasn't for meetups, I would not have changed my life. And one thing with that, I started going to these meetups and I asked the same question that everyone asks when they go to a meetup. How do I get that first job in tech? How do I break into this industry? I'm learning this thing. How do I get these jobs? And it was almost like a bo broken record that I heard the exact same thing over and over and over again. Oh man, that first job, whoo! That first one, that's hard. But if you get that first one, every other job after that will become easy as can be. I thought this was the worst answer you could tell me because not only have you demotivi demotivated and demoralized me, you've given me zero action items to work on. You've given me no ways for me to improve my chances to land a job in tech. And then I realized just scanning the room that there were many other people that were asking the exact same question. How do I break in this industry? How do I get this job? And they got the exact same answer. I realized at that moment I need to take it upon myself to change the perception that it is the hardest thing in the world to get that first job. I need to create an environment and a network that will allow people to show that they're passionate about what they're doing, show that they're passionate about what they're learning, and land a job. So that is what I set out to do. I joined a meetup, and the group was called Code Connector, and they're a great group, and I started working with them. And the goal was to help bring our community together, and we were bringing resources and bringing an environment for people to uh, network and talk and learn. And then that is how I started helping people land jobs. And then uh, in October of last year, uh, I started GDG Memphis, which is Google Developers Group Memphis, we're a group backed by Google Developers. And at that meetup, that is when I started bringing more resources, more courses to give out more learning resources to people that need it. Because I realized we have so many talented people in underprivileged communities where they don't have the money to purchase courses. They don't have the ability to get these resources. So if we can give it to them and they can learn, we can change their outcomes, their incomes, and their abilities to change their own lives. So that is exactly what I focused on. Last year, I was able to help 44 people land their first jobs in tech. Eric Garner, I can't breathe. Failure in life to me was waking up every single morning and doing something that I just didn't want to do. And I just realized very quickly that I just cannot spend the rest of my life working these 80 hour weeks in a gas station and frying chicken. And that is all I was doing. And I realized I was 30 years old. I realized I'm at the bottom. I had I looked in the mirror and I had a conversation with myself where I said, okay, I'm at the bottom right now. Either I change and I turn left and change my life or I turn right and I stay in this position forever. And it is up to me, it is my own bearing of what I do. No one is entitled to change my life. It is my dream, it is my choice. I can't look for validation in others. I can't go to someone saying, this is my dream and hope that they see the exact same thing that I see. I can't hope that they believe in me the way I believe in myself. I have a vision and I just had to go for it. And I just started learning and I learned and I learned. And I remember in the beginning, I started telling people, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start learning how to code. And you know how you make a change and people are like, oh, that's that's cool. Yeah, go ahead, go, go learn how to code. That's awesome. And then you start getting good at something. You start making progress. You start making traction. That support quickly turns into jealousy. And now they're trying to pull you back down. Oh, you can't code. Coding is not for people like us. Coding is not for people like us in a gas station. Coding is for those smart people. You're right. Coding isn't for people like us. It's for me. This is my path. I don't need your validation to chase after this dream I have. I have a vision and I'm going after it. I will not allow you to end my dream. I will not allow you to pull me back down. Haters, as you rise, they try to rise with you just to pull you back down. They don't want your success. If you start developing haters, that just means you're literally doing something right. 
that just means you're making progress in the best ways possible. Allow those haters to come. I feed off those haters. They're my motivation. If I don't have enough haters, that means I'm not doing enough right. I need to keep going and keep grinding and keep going. Understand, you need to change your shoulds to have tos. I kept saying for a long time, I should learn a code. I should change my life. I should go do this. I should, 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 should. I always say, you know, the coulda, shoulda, wouldas, and I never did anything. Once I made coding, I have to learn how to code. I have to get this job in tech. I moved mountains to make this possible. I moved mountains. I developed this vision. If you could see the same vision that I see, you would do the same things that I do. And I tell that to people all the time. I wake up consistently 4 o'clock in the morning to study, to prepare, to grow. I wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning not because it's fun to wake up before. I hate mornings. When I wake up at four, my family wakes up at seven. That gives me three hours that are uninterrupted in every way possible to reach whatever I'm trying to reach. Now, I'm not saying it's time for you to start waking up at four o'clock in the morning. Four o'clock is just a number on the clock. It means nothing. It's arbitrary. My four o'clock could be your seven o'clock. My four o'clock could be your 10 p.m. All I'm saying is you need to find the most productive hours in your day and make sure you utilize them so you can reach exactly whatever you're trying to reach. And I don't care if you're a senior developer. I don't care if you're an aspiring developer. We all need those hours of productivity. I always say to be a developer is to go on a lifelong journey of learning. And the other thing for me is I know that we all have greatness in us. Every single one of us have greatness in us. For whatever reason, we've come up with this concept where greatness is an item that only belongs to a select few, like the celebrities, the workout gurus, the geniuses of the world. But greatness is as common as breathing. It is in all of us. Haven't you noticed when you reach some like monumental level, you've just achieved your greatness. So stop looking at this person. Oh, they're great. You're discounting their success and you're allowing your own success to be discounted. Stop doing that. You have greatness in you. You just need to remember it to tap into it. Tap into it and reach the levels that you want to reach. You will absolutely do amazing things if you allow yourself to do it. You will absolutely touch a new level if you allow yourself to do it. Stop getting in your own way. There are so many times where we'll get in our own way. Even for me, for years, you know, my wife would tell me, you're, you're way better than frying chicken. You're way better than bringing up customers. And I gotta say, you know, I never went to college. I don't have a degree. I don't come from an educational background. I grew up in the hood. These people don't want me. They don't want someone like me. And I allowed myself to stop myself. Once I moved that obstacle, nothing in the universe could have stopped me at that point. Nothing would I would allow, nothing to stop me. I saw my vision. I created my vision. And I said, I'm going straight for it. I'm going to win. I'm going to make my dream come true because the thing about a dream, it is unobtainable. But if you take your dream and put a date next to it, you just made a goal. Now I'm going to drink some water and I have a very manly cup. So excuse me for a second. You know how some people act when I start drinking water, they start freaking out. Oh, you're taking a break. No, no, no. Greatness is not new. Greatness is not unique. Greatness is in all of us. You can be phenomenal if you want to. You can do anything that you want to. And remember something. Life is so incredibly short. You are here today and you could be gone today. You could be here today and be gone tomorrow. We can go at any moment. And that is what kind of clicked for me. My entire life, I was focused on how can I work the hardest? How can I bring home the most amount of money? How can I do whatever I need to do? And something clicked. And maybe it's getting older. I don't know. It's an epiphany moment. But I am no longer obsessed with the idea of making as much money as I can. I am obsessed with trying to leave this world in a little better shape than the way I found it. The only guarantee I have for every single person watching this, every single person viewing these clips later on, and for myself, that we will all leave this universe one way or another. There's no way around it, and we will not go gracefully. It will be 
a very interesting experience and be the last experience. I don't care how rich you are, how poor you are, you're going to go the same way. So why don't we utilize some of these efforts to help raise others? I always say if you're not helping else, if you're not helping someone else change their life, then you're not doing something profound. And I'm a big believer in your life will become better by changing another life. I I cannot tell you how much joy, how much passion, and how addicting it became to help the very first person land their first job in tech. They had tears well up in their eyes. And I realized at that moment, nothing mattered more to this person than achieving what they just achieved. And nothing mattered to me in that moment than watching their success and celebrating it with them. If we help others change their lives, we're making an economic shift. We're changing the outcome of our communities. That is why I do meetups. We're providing resources. We're providing groups. Memphis has some of the lowest cost of living in the country. And we have some areas that have some of the lowest earners in the country. We have an area in particular where the household average income is $18,000 per household, not per person, per household. The top three most common jobs in that area are a restaurant worker, retail worker, and bus driver. If I can take one person, provide them the learning resources, provide them the community, help them learn what they need to learn, we will absolutely change that person's life. We can now take that person, put them in a developer job where they're making $80,000 a year. They're now generating four and a half times the average household income in that area. If I can get 20 people from that same area, we just changed the neighborhood. That person now has more expendable income. They have more resources. Well, guess what? They're also in a new tax bracket. Now the schools are getting more resources. Now the children are benefiting off of that one person changing their life. We're changing the neighborhood and we're giving resources to the one communities that need it the most. If we can take these people, and even if they don't become developers, I always say it's important to learn programming, even if you're not going to become a developer, because it gives you a unique way to approach problems. You're breaking down problems in ways most other jobs do not bring you those uh, abilities for. For example, you could take this into construction. I, I speak at prisons quite often, and I was speaking at a prison not too long ago, and I said, you're learning how to code. You're learning a unique set of skills, but you're also learning how to problem solve. What if you don't get a job in programming? Let's say you get a job in retail. Well, now you know I need to build this merchandising display. Well, now you know, well, let me break it down. Instead of saying I need a display, well, I need the base. I need the midsection. I need the stack. I need the overall appearance. You've just broken that down into a way you normally wouldn't break that down. If we can change these communities, we can change and bring an economic boost to our, our cities. So for me, Memphis, I helped 44 people in the first jobs in tech last year. I helped 24 this year. I was on track to be, but, you know, coronavirus popped up out of nowhere. We weren't expecting that. But uh, 44 people, that's almost, almost $400,000 in economic development that we were able to bring to our community. That money can now change all, I'm sorry, 400,000. I don't know why I said that, 4 million. $4 million in economic development. That is $4 million that didn't exist in these communities that they now have purchasing power. They now have buying power. They can spend that money in their local markets. This money is going to circulate. It's going to build up these communities. And the one way to change that, the one way to bring that change is by learning resources. And another thing we need to bring, they don't need just the learning resources. They need financial literacy. I've noticed when I, so I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I grew up in a very poor area. Financial literacy was not spoken about. I, to my mother to this day, she says, oh, 401k, that's a stock market. You know, that, that's, that's for rich folks to lose their money. Th these concepts need to be broken down and explained so people in these communities, even if they are earning a lower income than others, can start saving for the future. Social security should not be the number one retirement goal. It is not sustainable. There's very, it's very likely it won't be around by the time we reach there. We need to make sure we are explaining and teaching people how to make their money multiply. And the only way we're going to do that, financial literacy. And it brings it back to the same point. When I was frying chicken, there was zero financial literacy. 
When I was frying chicken, no one explained to me that I need to be setting aside 5%, 10% of my income. And then I started growing out of that. And someone said to me, well, you need to make an emergency fund. Take 10% of your income and save it for emergency. Stock up six months worth of your bills. And if you do that, if you get fired, you'll be able to survive. I said, that's a good idea. So I started doing that. And then from there, I said, okay, now I'm making more money. I'm in a programming position. I'm definitely making more money than frying chicken. And so now I go say, okay, I'm a developer now. My company is giving me stock options. My company is giving me a 401k. What are these things? If we do not educate people on how to save and make their money multiply, they will continue to go down the exact same path that they know about. There are certain privileged communities where this is common knowledge within the family. The families are teaching this to their children at younger ages because this is something they're doing and they know about. We need to educate all of our communities on financial literacy so they share this as a very important and growing item for their children while they're in your junior high school years and their high school years. Because once they do that, you reach 18, you're going to start saving. You get that first job, you're going to start saving. And I always say, and that's the one, it reminds me of this. I always say, you know, I wish I knew about financial literacy. I wish I knew about coding when I was younger. And I would say, you know, I wish I knew this. If I knew this then, back then, I would be so successful now. Well, it didn't happen that way. I didn't know about coding. So am I going to allow that to stop me from reaching every single level that I want to reach now? Is that going to stop me from making sure that I make sure my family's taken care of? Am I going to make sure that I make sure that my child is taken care of or the children in my community? Tamir Rice. And am I going to make sure that I do everything within my power to reach where I need to reach? Remember, life is incredibly short. You can start saving today, and it might not be enough time, so start now. And one important thing, don't cap your success. By capping your success, you are stopping yourself from reaching the levels you want to reach. And I always say, don't make your goals small. And if you if you say, I want to make a million dollars, I guarantee you will make a million dollars, but you won't make a million five. You won't make two. You won't go past that. I never had the goal of becoming a junior developer. My goal was to be the best developer I could be. I want to solve problems. I want to come up with solutions. And I said, I'm not going to be a junior developer. I'm not going to be an entry-level developer. I'm going to be the best developer I could be. And so, of course, in order to be the best developer I could be, of course, junior and entry are going to come. They're natural stepping stones. They came. I got it. And within no time, I was promoted from that position. I see so many people just say, I wish to be a junior developer. I wish to be a junior developer. They get the junior developer. They get that first taste of success, and then they quit. And you quit because you got exactly what you wanted. You set your bar so low that you didn't see anything past that. You stop striving, and you stop that passion that you had. Keep that passion in your heart. If you keep the passion in your heart, you continue to strive and hit new levels. Stop. I always say, you know, when a person is hungry, they will do it anything within the realm of reality to achieve what they need. They want to get a meal. They'll do anything possible to get that meal. When you are satisfied, you almost hit a state where you're too content to go past an uncomfortable level. Do not allow yourself to get too comfortable because when you're, haven't you noticed in the morning you're so cozy, you don't want to get out of bed. It's almost like it's a fight to get out. Very same concept here. You have to allow yourself to become influenced by being uncomfortable. When you are uncomfortable, you will do anything to become comfortable. So for me, my goalpost constantly moves before I even reach there. I will not allow myself to reach my goal easily. And here's another thing. You need to have very big goals. Make your goals so big that you get excited when you think about them. Philando Castile, you said you weren't going to shoot. Make your goals so big that when you look at them, you get excited. I get out of bed 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm not fighting to get out of bed 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm not going, oh, oh 4 a.m. I'm excited to say three, three hours right now that I'm going to dedicate towards getting towards my goal. I was. It took me eight months, and I was able to just just this, just a couple days ago, I was able to give Black Girls Code $1,000 in learning resources. That has been a goal of mine since October of last year. You need to make these goals big. Now, I'm not a company. I, I thousand dollars is a lot of money to me. A thousand dollars is a lot of money to a lot of people. That can impact so many women learning how to code, so many girls learning how to code and change their future. 
We need to make sure we're doing something to leave an impact in our communities because one ripple can make a huge change. And that's what I say. We need to make so many ripples that the wave of change is so overwhelming that no one can turn it down, that no one can even underestimate the power that we bring to the table. And if you surround yourself with a community of like-minded individuals, can you imagine how strong that change would be? I always say there's we have strong buying power in our communities. If we team together, the, the ripple effect that that creates for people is so overwhelming that they bend to whatever you're asking them to do. But it needs to be that for everything besides just activism. We need to say we need to bring lear more learning resources. We need to bring more opportunities. We need to bring more jobs. Bringing those things and you bring your whole community around you, you can make change that is so lasting that grandchildren will feel that change. That is how we lift our communities from being $14,000, $15,000, $18,000 households to $100,000, $120,000, $150,000 households. It's okay if you get a job for 50 grand and your spouse gets a job for 50 grand. Your household is now generating five and a half times the household income it was generating two years ago, three years ago. You're going to land somewhere in 2025. You're going to land somewhere. I don't know where. You don't know where, but you can make the decisions now that you will land anywhere in June of 2025, and you can make those moves now. Make the moves now that you in five years from now will thank you for making these decisions on Juneteenth. Thank you for making changing our outcome. Thank you for you know thinking about us, Botham Jean. Thank you for thinking about everything that you can change here. You can change your life, your children's life, your mother's life, your parents' life. And you the only way you're going to do that is discovering the reason why you're doing something, your why. What is your why? What is what is the thing that's powering this move? And you can say, oh, it's to you know, make a paycheck. Paycheck is not a why. You can get a paycheck from anywhere. Is your passion coming from, I want to change my life? Is my passion coming from, I want to change the outcome for my spouse? I want to change the living standards for my children. I want to change the living standards for my mother and father. I want to go from riding on a bus and riding on a train to driving my own car. I want to stop eating from the dollar store, and I want to go shop at Kroger. I want to go shop at uh, uh, Super Low. I want to go shop at all these uh, big stores. I want to change my circumstances. Now, that's a why. If you know your why, the how is easy. It doesn't matter how you're going to do it. It doesn't matter if you need to stay up for three days in a row, and it doesn't matter if you need to keep studying. It does None of that matters once you have that passion to actually achieve what you want to achieve. That is the difference. Understand and realize why you're doing something. Brianna Taylor, she just got off from work. Haters are going to follow you. Haters are going to try and stop you. Do not allow them to pull you down. Do not allow them to stop you. And don't allow yourself to be your own hater. We're our own worst enemy. Keep your vision so strong, so profound that nothing can allow you to stop yourself. Because I remember I would talk to myself and talk myself out of every single conversation. I would talk myself out of everything that I could do. Don't allow yourself to do that. You don't need to do that. We're our own worst enemy, but we're our, our own best coach. We can give ourselves the motivation, ideas that we need. Haven't you and that's one thing that people need to do. You need to have a conversation with yourself. You need to talk to yourself. Haven't you ever gone on a drive somewhere, you just stared out the window, and you started coming up with images like, oh, if I was in a music video, and I'd be doing this right now, and this song would be playing. You need to do the same thing with your life. How are you going to change it? What is going to be the outcome? What are, what are you going to look like when you're 40? What are you going to look like when you're 60? What are you going to look like when you're 25? These things can absolutely change. And I always tell people, tech is amazing for one thing because regardless of your age, you can make an impact here. I, I work with a 22-year-old. I started learning how to code at 30. My best friend, well, not best friend, my closest friend, best friend, he's 49 in tech. And I met an amazing, phenomenal 60-year-old who was working as a front-end engineer. 
You can change your life in any way that you want, but you have to remove all of the, I, it's not for me, it's not for me. Stop being afraid to fail. I love failing. Failure to me just means I'm removing one obstacle on my path to success. If it doesn't work, cool. I realized it didn't work and I'm still headed down my way. Stop allowing yourself to be afraid of failing. Here's my guarantee to you right now, and I don't care how old you are. You're going to fail at least 100 times more before you end your career. You're going to fail at least 100 times more before your time comes. You are going to fail. Guarantee it. So stop being afraid now. Now you know. Surprise, it's gone. You're going to fail. Stop allowing the failure and the fear of failure to hold you back. Because I've seen so many phenomenal, incredible people learning how to code. And as soon as they fail, oh, this ain't for me. Time to go back to working as a barista. Time to go back to working at the restaurant. Time to go back to working at the gas station. Don't allow that fear to take over you. When I was working at the gas station, I was working 80 plus hours a week. Matter of fact, when my son was born, I was I worked 102 hours a week. And, it, and I worked hard enough just to still be broke. I worked hard enough to still be depressed when I looked at my paycheck. I worked hard enough to literally look at that and say, I still need to work. And when I made my change, I was waking up 2.30 in the morning to study before going to work because I didn't have the hours. It just didn't exist in my life. I wish it did. I wish I could tell you I was studying at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It just wasn't there. I had to create the hours. Create whatever hours whenever you need it. Only reason why I stick to the mornings I realize I don't retain as much information as I do at night than I do in the morning. For whatever reason, when my brain is fresh, it's absorbing, it's pulling it in, it's taking in all that information and keeping it. It helps me retain more. Find out what works for you and keep doing it. Keep going. You don't have to stop. One big thing that I also say, don't, don't, don't allow your what ifs or your shoulda, woulda, couldas to say anything about you. It's okay if you're a little late to the game. It's okay that you know you didn't do this the time period that you wanted to do it. It's okay. I'm letting you know now. It's okay. Ahmaud Arbery. It's okay. You can breathe. You can go. You can keep producing any single thing that you want. You can bring. And I always say this. I was stuck in that gas station. I didn't believe anything was there for me besides that. I was not born to fry chicken. You are not born to work in circumstances that you don't want to work in. Even if you're a developer, you're not born to work in a company that doesn't respect you. Your life was not brought to fruition. My life wasn't brought to fruition to do something arbitrary that I don't want to do. I'm going to do exactly what I want to do. I'm going to produce the things that I need to produce, and I'm going to give myself and my family exactly what we need. I'm going to be where I belong. I'm not going to allow anything to dissuade me. I'm not going to allow anything to choose my destiny for me besides myself. You are not going to allow anything to dissuade you. You absolutely got this. And I remember so many times I would talk to myself and, you know, imposter syndrome is real. And I think a lot of people doubt it's real until they get faced with it. Burnout is real. I always say don't burn yourself out because the recovery takes way longer than just pulling back for a couple of days. If you feel yourself going, pull back. Haven't you noticed like on a slingshot or like a catapult, you have that tension and that tension just means you're going to fling yourself, right? Pull yourself back. Allow that tension and it'll catapult you to the next level. But what happens, don't get too comfortable in pulling yourself back. Because when something is held in tension for too long, the tension turns into slack. The elastic loses its elasticity and it's not going to fling you now. So keep your balance. Take your time. I always The reason why I keep my goals on my wall over here between my TV and my computer, they face me. I have to see them. So if I'm going to say I'm going to watch Netflix, you know, I'm going to I'm going to binge watch eight episodes. Do I really want to spend eight hours? Am I close enough to my goals to spend eight hours just watching TV? Or can I have my downtime, watch two episodes and now spend this next six hours making a better version of myself, changing the life from my children, changing the life from my wife, changing the life from my mother? Those six hours can produce so much. You can achieve so much in that time period. And imposter syndrome, 
I had imposter syndrome five minutes before doing this. I remember uh, talking to someone and I said, you know, we're about to find out together if this talk is going to be good or bad. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I get nervous. Even when I talk at these prisons, I'm talking to these prisoners. You know, they have nothing. They're, they're, they're in circumstances where they're learning how to code. They don't have Internet, so they can't look up a problem. The only person with Internet access is the instructor. They are so passionate. They're going through these circumstances with limited resources to change their lives. And the reason why I'm so passionate about talking to prisoners that are learning how to code, prisoners that learn how to code, their recidivism rate, their revisit rate to a prison drops to almost zero. It's that concept of if you teach a man to fish or teach a woman to fish, they can eat for a day. Uh, no, if you give them a fish, they can eat for a day. But if you teach them a fish, they can eat for life. You're giving them a tangible, realistic tool that they can change their life with. Even there's many companies that don't hire prisoners, and we understand. We can't force you to change that. But if they can't find a job, they can freelance. They can now provide an income. Now they're not even turned on or, to, or, or attracted to, be, you know, drug uh, uh, doing drugs or or gang violence or going into these bad circumstances that landed them where they were, or even bad influences. A lot of people don't make violent crimes land in jail. You could do something stupid and land in there, or you could be accused falsely, and now you need a way to change that up. So make sure you're paying attention to anything in that respect, you can change your life. And remember, you know, I, I, I had to talk myself out from my imposter syndrome. I used to tell myself all the time when I'm trying to find a job, you're nothing. You came from nothing. You're going to be nothing. You know, you work in a gas station, you're going to die in a gas station. They don't want a professional chicken fryer. They want a programmer. They don't want you. You'll never make it. Are you going to, you're going to interview and you smell like fried chicken. They, they could see right through you. They don't want you. You, they could see right through. Go back to where you belong. My doubts, my imposter syndrome, all my haters. I made it. I'm Danny Thompson, and I'm a software engineer. Thank you. I think we're going to wrap up to do a Q&A real fast. Awesome. Thank you so much, Danny. Uh, that was just, oh my gosh, all the nuggets that you dropped, the wisdom here. I am so inspired and so motivated. Um, I loved every single topic, and especially when you talk about changing the communities and how when we create that change in the community, I mean, we're changing the world bit by bit. And sometimes the small efforts don't seem big enough, but just little steps really take us to that level of empowering and changing an entire city, an entire country. Um, so I don't see the Q&A just yet. Um, are there any questions um, from the live comments that we that we have online. I'm, I'm just monitoring now. Look as well. Uh, if not, then I'll just pivot on your point about success. You said, um, don't don't cap your success is one of your main things. Yes. And from your experience, what was one of the things that you did to kind of overcome that? Because I think a lot of people have experienced that. You know, you set your level and you may set it too low. Um, how, how do you change and pivot if you have put a cap on it? Then what are some of the things that you can do to really remove that and pivot? So the when you cap your success, the first thing is you have to recognize that. You have to recognize that your goal is so, so small. And the other thing with that is you need and this is the one thing that changed my life. You have to keep your goals so big that you get excited by them. Like I, I've got goals on my wall right now and some I don't want to share because I'm a big believer in if you keep talking about your goals, nobody cares. They care about what you've actually done. Let your actions speak volumes for you. Eric Garner, I can't breathe. And the reason for that is if your goals are so big, like for, for example, one goal was for me $1,000 for a black girl's code. That's a lot of money for me, you know. I had to do a lot to get those learning resources for those girls. I know the positive, and I'm a big believer in positive impact creates more positive impact. These girls are going to learn, and they're going to produce something so profound that it's going to affect lives. I know it. I feel it. They've, if you've seen the passion these girls have, and that is why I'm so passionate about giving 
uh, resources to our underserved communities, their passion is infectious. It's like a fire and we're just spreading the embers. I've seen so many phenomenal things come out of these communities. And if we give them the opportunity, they're going to do some amazing things. So, but the problem is their goals are so small because they know they're pigeonholed mm -hmm. into this category. Once you start saying, you don't need to look at the small goal anymore, raise it. That's when they start reaching new levels of success. You have yeah. to raise your levels. Awesome. Thank you again so much. And I think that was just a great point to, to pivot and to end on. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we will have our next session starting here in a bit. And thank you again, Danny. Um, I can't say enough how grateful we are for you sharing your experience and your life journey and really inspiring us and motivating us to do more. You know, um, we don't recognize the, the effort um, or the impact that we have within us. Um, and, and like, let's start small because small becomes big. It grows. Um, thank you again. The one so last thing I would want to say is I, I thank everyone for having me here. And George Floyd, I can't breathe. Thank you.